Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome, Julie Kay. Welcome. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go with it. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna roll here. So, um, Julie Kay is in the same state as I am. Uh, and we're gonna talk about Wisconsin here because we're both in Wisconsin, but mm -hmm. I did want to let everyone know, Julie Kay is uh, a dietitian like myself and also a chef. Mm -hmm. So we can, she can talk both sides of her mouth, food, nutrition, and the culinary arts. And that we're gonna go right into that today um, mm -hmm. in this environment when people are suddenly like at home. <laughs> and now what do I do? I have four walls. The kitchen waits for you, everyone. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go into that. But are you, let's talk about Wisconsin, because yeah. I want people to know where Wisconsin is. Mm -hmm. right not we, enough people know <laughs> not enough people go so we're gonna orient you just a bit of fun but you uh, are you a born and bred Wisconsinite or I am not actually I've lived here for almost 10 years maybe maybe eight or nine okay. and I'm from Michigan originally the lower lower part of Michigan not the okay. upper part although I have family in the in the upper peninsula but I'm from the Grand Rapids area so oh um, right okay yes Mm -hmm. So we moved here. My husband got a job here out of college. And then when I was done with grad school, I moved here. So Okay. She so kind of moved around. Everyone moved around Lake Michigan. Yes. All the way around. <laughs> all the way around. Right via the UP or you can come via Chicago and yeah, go up. <laughs> exactly. So this is Wisconsin, right? It's not the mitten, right? No. <laughs> this is no. Wisconsin. This is Lake Michigan. And you may think, why is she doing this? Well, because I moved to the upper Midwest three years ago, uh, two and a half years ago. And um, I even I had to orient myself like, wh where's Michigan now? Where's the UP? Uh, where, where is Wisconsin? Um, mm -hmm. So where are you? Here's, here's our minute. You have to do your hand. Where I are do? you in okay. Wisconsin? Do the hand. Right? <laughs> is it the right way facing on yeah, video? Yeah, yeah, whichever way. So like, where are you in Wisconsin? <laughs> so I'm kind of in the upper part, like not way up, like Green Bay is north of us. So most people know Green Bay for the Packers. I'm about 40 minutes south of Green Bay. So it in is considered Appleton. Northeast Wisconsin. So you're in Appleton, right? Appleton, just south Appleton. of Appleton. Yep. Appleton. And, little... and Appleton's like an hour maybe from the Packers. Yes, okay. exactly. Yep, so it's not too far. I live just south of Appleton in a little area called Nina. It's kind of a little suburb almost of Appleton. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. close for my husband's work. So that's why we chose here. We love it. Um, we live on sort of almost a half an acre lot. We have lots of space to like garden and all that stuff. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Wisconsin is very forbidding like that. For, yeah, for, forbidding, uh, forgiving. Yes. Uh, in that it really is a lot of wide open spaces. You drive a long way between cities uh, or big towns. Yeah. <laughs> we have two cities kind of really, right? Now we have Green Bay. Um, right, right. Which we're in the middle of all those. We're in the middle, sort of the middle in Appleton of Green Bay. Madison and Milwaukee. Right. So here's, here's, this is not Michigan. Here's, right. This, this is, is Wisconsin. not Michigan. But this thing here, this little thing here, everyone talked to me about Door County. Um, yeah. And Door County is this sort of thumb that mm -hmm. juts out into Lake Michigan. And it's, it's beautiful, right? It's There's gorgeous. Wine country, cherries, amazing hiking, biking. And you really surrounded by water. It's like a peninsula until it hooks in via Green Bay to, mm -hmm. yeah, to sort of quite the mainline Wisconsin. It is. Over you know, here. I'm from Michigan, so Michigan's Door County is Traverse City area. Oh, that's which right. Which has like the Cherry Festival and all that wow. stuff. They're very similar, both yeah. gorgeous. They, they really are. Uh, absolutely gorgeous so you know we're supposed to be talking with food but you end up with a geography lesson this morning well, we're getting to cherries we're getting into the, the wine and all that good stuff so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's interesting, it's a pretty big state um it takes me a while to get to where julie is it's probably about three hour drive for me yeah. at least. And, uh, green bay really is about four hours from where i am so i'm down here um, south, wait southwestern wisconsin i'm on the mississippi uh, in, excuse me are you lacrosse? I'm in lacrosse. So we have okay. University of Wisconsin lacrosse. And right, of course, opposite us is Minnesota. So you can go across the bridge. You just go a little south of lacrosse and you can see Iowa, Iowa, Iowa oh, wow. <laughs> across the river. So it's a very, very diverse state. Um, where you are, it's more flat, right? But you mm -hmm. go north, it's very, very wooded. 
south of you is kind of like it's open fields right it's dairy yeah. corn soy whatever is being grown and then when i am is where the glaciers came through the state um it pushed kind of all the silt if you will into this very uh and we call it the bluffs this sort of mm -hmm. very hilly area um so it's a really diverse state and i have to say julie i don't know probably where you are you have a lot of water of course yeah. i have a lot of water the bird life in this state is amazing it is and where you live is absolutely gorgeous i mean just driving through is beautiful i've been there a few times but heading to like rochester minnesota it is it, especially in the fall it's yes. just beautiful it, and yeah. i don't think a lot of people know that no when we first drove in we we're coming in you know through the dakotas you know it's yeah. like super flat well it does undulate and if you go through south dakota you have these beautiful um, sunflowers because they're growing mm -hmm. oil seed, but it's just absolutely stunning. Then yeah. you hit the Mississippi and right across is La Crosse where I live. And it's the Mississippi is absolutely beautiful and the mm -hmm. sun was shiny. It was fall, like you said. And you've got all these like little islands. So I thought, where am I? I'm yeah. like in the Lake District here. It's absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. So it is. Um, we're gushing about Wisconsin. <laughs> I know. And we're not we're known for the cheese, which we should be known for because it is really, I mean, even just coming from Michigan. Here, the cheese is is amazing. It really is so good, and I think we're we're definitely known for that in the Packers. But um, it is beautiful as well. So I'm glad we threw that in there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, awesome. And let's talk about cheese because everyone thinks of Wisconsin and cheese and the cheese heads. You go to the Packer games, you don't see that so so much anymore. Um, and the cheese curds. But what has been great uh, that I found is yeah you've got cheese but you have a lot of artisan producers mm -hmm. in wisconsin so we're very proud of our cheese but kind of just yeah. like california you're starting to see many many artisan producers and i'm telling you absolutely amazing uh, that i've tasted and charcuterie as well mm -hmm. amazing yeah so, the variety and even just driving through the really small towns you can find the best little cheese store that has all this wine all these amazing selections and flavors and just things you've never tried before and like you said the charcuterie you can get amazing like smoked summer sausages and all these different things and just i mean i could live off from that <laughs> that is a big plate of vegetables and you there know, the you go bread. that's all we need <laughs> That's so true. So uh, we, we just have to wax poetical about the upper Midwest because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I've lived all over the U.S. as well. And we, we I think, quote, flyover country is uh, supposedly south of us because you really have to kind of go up north to hit Wisconsin. Yeah. But um, it's really been delightful um, mm -hmm. living here. So great to chat with you. And we're, I guess we're both um, kind of not natives from here. Definitely not me. I grew up the other side of the pond, as you know. The yeah. big pond. <laughs> So um, let's talk food, mm -hmm. and I want to get to talk about your book later too, but um, sure. let's talk about food because all of a sudden um, we've had to, we've, uh, many, many people, 80% of us are now sequestered in our homes mm -hmm. and the kitchen, you can't, you can't bypass it. It's still the center of the home, right? So all of a sudden people may be squished on a budget. Um, maybe have to they, they know they can't order out it's i mean you can but it's very difficult you can't go out to a restaurant so you're staring at your refrigerator you many of you are probably in it a lot <laughs> these yes. days. so it's and many people have not honed their um, culinary skills never had a chance maybe depends if they mm -hmm. had that in school or not but so they're faced with okay i've got to put food on the table right right yep. and it isn't necessarily going to come out of a box because that's expensive or they've run out at the supermarket. So I guess the question is, where do people start if they say, okay, <laughs> may as well suck it up. We're home for eight weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. I got to do something. Where, where can you start? I mean, what yeah. you, a couple of things they could do right now to well, get out know, of the there, box. <laughs> there are so many, there are so many things you can cook without really knowing how to cook, which is right. really cool. And that's where sort of pantry staples come in. I like to keep things like beans and lentils and spices and some of those sort of basic things that are shelf stable that we can keep in our pantry to throw a chili or a soup or something really easy together that's also extremely affordable. I mean, we can get a bag of beans for a dollar or a couple of cans for $2 and they're so nutritious 
and give protein, fiber, all those things that we need to make a, a really sustain, sustaining meal. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with not a lot of money and not a lot of skill needed either. So I try to keep those types of things in my pantry. Um, and if you don't normally, those are some of the things that we can get right now that are going to last. And, um, and we can make something really simple like soup stews, a casserole. We love casseroles in the Midwest. <laughs> kind of a so, staple, right? <laughs> it's a staple. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it tastes better if we put in some onion and garlic and those types of things, which take a little bit of skill to chop. But, you know, um, I like to use the internet as a resource for ways to find how to chop something. Like, if I don't know how to, if I don't know what I'm doing with this vegetable or whatever it is, I'll just quick look up, how do I chop this? And then that's the way to start practicing. And now is sort of a good time for that. I know not all of us are just sitting at home waiting to cook. Correct. We have kids to take care of and we're still working and doing those things, but, um, now's a really good time to learn some of those really basic things that you can use for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And I want to come back to some grab and go things. Um, but as you said, now's a yeah. really good time. Yeah. Cause there's so many things like, Oh, let's quickly put five ideas out there. You would like yeah. to do it like that. But what comes to mind is of course, you know, uh, now as I've watched you, you probably have with parents, like the first week, all the kids are at, at, at home. It was chaos. Right. I said, wait, wait, I'm supposed to be at work. How come they're under my feet? And yeah. you watch it, it's like, oh, someone's gonna get hurt. You know, you see mm -hmm. these comments. Second week, the kids are starting to be friends. The third week, everyone's the best friend, right? Yeah. So chaos is kind of, at least for some people, it's gotten a little more organized as a mm -hmm. routine. But how about not utilizing, bringing your kids into the kitchen? I mean, how, Ooh. what What a great time to, bring them in or say, Hey kids, you're 15 years old. You're going to help me. Like, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't have kids myself yet, but I, um, I've worked with a lot of kids in my past, past life in, t I've run teaching kitchens and taught lots and lots of cooking classes and have worked with kids. And you know what? They actually really love being in the kitchen. And even if they've never tried it before, it's like, Oh my gosh, this is so much fun. I can put fruit into a blender and make a smoothie. I can wash the fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. underwater to help my parents. I can, um, you know, they have kids safe knives that you can use yeah. to help show them to chop. They can tear spinach leaves and throw them in a pot. They can mix together, you know, dry ingredients in a bowl. Yeah. Really, really small tasks. And then they love doing it. They really love it. And um, I think, and there's actually research that shows that kids who are in the kitchen at a younger age, even if they're just watching and you're talking them through what they're, what you're doing are more likely to be adventurous eaters. And that's what we all want as parents, right? Is our kids to try different things and, you know, not to have the fight at night at the table right, of like, eat right. your vegetables. Um, and so there's so many little tasks that they can do that can actually help you out, especially dishes. Don't forget dishes. <laughs> Even if it's loading or unloading yes. the dishwasher. Good yes, point. and if they're little, of course, you know, like the plastic things or things that are not break breakable, but just really small things that they can do to help out is actually going to make a big difference in their, in their lives as far as food goes and being able to make a quick meal um, and just their relationship with food overall. Totally. So I, I love the idea of getting them involved at any age. What about if you were a... A parent who doesn't like to cook. In fact, your skills are awful. You you were the call out person, yeah. you know, and now you really can. Now what are you gonna do? It's like how do you kind of acknowledge you're not a great cook or you just, it's not your area, but you wanna bring the kids in too and say, you know sure. what, help mom. We're we're exhausted, <laughs> you know, I need some help. How mm -hmm. do you kind of empower the kids to find a recipe or what what would be the idea there, maybe? Prepare. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you mentioned grab and go type stuff. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There are a lot yeah. of great options out there for canned items and frozen items that you can put together. There are some really great brands now that offer, I guess, more wholesome recipe or, or food products that you can just, you know, sort of heat and eat. And there's absolutely exactly. nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's all of the food delivery services that, yes, they're a little backed up right now, but normally... Yeah. 
<laughs> Normally, um, those are a great way to start um, cooking too if you're not really skilled in the kitchen. But if you, if your kids are interested or take an interest in it, if you bring it up to them, there, I mean, kids as little as like fourth grade can start reading recipes. And even if it's, you know, something super basic, that's a great place to start. And having them sort of lead the charge of like, mom, this is what sounds good this week. I want to make enchiladas or I want to make tacos. Um, I want to make a soup, whatever it is, and sort of let them lead the meal plan because then it's going to be just dinner time is going to be more streamlined. Like they have helped choose that. They help prepare it and that empowers them. And it takes some of the load off from you to let them take the charge. Yeah, totally. Uh, no, I, I love that. Like so many things went through my head. And also if you're a person who doesn't love to cook or it's yeah. just burdensome for some people, maybe because they don't have an opportunity to learn. It's not mm -hmm. a place of pleasure for some people, but to watch your kids do it, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, what a great time to do that. I'm sure there'll be some meltdowns and disasters. There are when we cook, right. right? It's like, oh, not so great. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's going to happen with anybody who, exactly. you know, in the kitchen, we have to let ourselves learn that way. That's how we learn. Exactly. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made in the kitchen. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I figured out something other, something else through this process that's really cool and tastes really awesome. And that's sort of how you learn. So it, I it, think exactly. be okay with some of those little hiccups when you're learning too. It, it totally. Mm -hmm. So talking about learning, um, one of the things, and I was talking with you before we kind of came on here about one of our colleagues, Wendy Jo, and I, I, she's also a chef like yourself. And I said, so, so what, how do you help people kind of not get started, but I, I can't even remember the question, but it was basically, if you were going to some, give somebody advice, um, is a step in the kitchen, what would, what would the advice be? And she said, pick two or three things mm -hmm. and learn how to do them well. It could be a salad, it could be a soup, and that's how you start. What, yes. what are your thoughts? And you could go right to a specific concept if you want. Yeah, you know, well, I think that the big, a big barrier with cooking for those who haven't, like didn't grow up cooking or are still sort of feeling like I'm not that great in the kitchen, is to just start. Like I mentioned, you don't have to be um, a pro chef to, obviously you need that experience. And I think confidence is the biggest barrier. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is gonna taste good. But the only way to get better is to, is to do it. And so even like, like Wendy said, just finding something that you can make. My husband's the perfect, perfect example because he is not a great cook, but he has like six things that he can make. Bingo. And he has his own recipes and it's like, if, if I'm not here or if he's feeling in the mood to make it, he can survive. <laughs> and that's important that's because, you know, he makes his meatloaf, he has tacos that he makes, he has a chili recipe. And if that's all he needs is those six things and he can make little changes to them based on what exactly. we have. And that gives him confidence. And I feel like that's the thing that a lot of us are missing in the kitchen is to just let ourselves learn and not feel like we have to be good at this right away because i just love like that. everything it takes it takes practice just like everything yeah totally and i love that idea from your husband it's like yep yeah, these are his ghosts like if julie if you're not there julie you know what he's eating but that's yeah. a good idea like even for yourself like i love tacos i'm not not me personally but you know if it's sure. i love tacos then that's where you start right mm -hmm. figure it out uh, or figure it out that's where you start yeah and, and play around with that that's such a great idea and once you've sort of mastered that basic recipe, then it's like, okay, I can do this. Now, what if I swap out some of these things, like some different toppings or a different protein instead of what if, whatever my normal one is, and then your skills just expand from there. I love it. It's like uh, uh, when I was teaching around the country, one of the things I, I taught people is that the way you expand your palate is you start with something familiar Kind of like wine, you know, if you know a Chardonnay from the Loire Valley in France, you'll try one from California or one from South Africa because you're comfortable with Chardonnay, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So then with tacos, it's like, as you said, you know, maybe you've always had ground beef, now you do chicken, maybe you do cod or something like that. I love totally. that. Yes, and then you can that. experiment with different tortillas and different toppings and just, there's so many different things you can do, but once you've mastered sort of that basic one, then, your, your confidence explodes and you're willing to try all these other things and it just opens up. 
Amazing. I, yeah. I love that. I love that. So something I wanted to ask you is um, some basic equipment in the kitchen. So a lot of people, I look this also from my colleague, Wendy Jo, a lot of people bought the Instant Pot in the last few years. And a lot of people, it's still in their boxes. I had no idea that that was the case. <laughs> kind of like buying a little pasta machine. It's like, yeah, mine's kind of still in the box. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, so you've got Instant Pot Air Fryer. Is there another, like, one or two pieces of equipment that you have found really make people's lives easier, like could break down the barrier, speed things up, anything come to mind? You know, I, I'm actually a fan of the basics. I, I, I do have an Instant Pot, and I do love it. I don't use it for everything. Like, a lot of people, like, live in the Instant Pot, and that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. I'm, those people could teach me a thing or two because I don't know everything about the Instant Pot, but I do love the pressure cooker aspect of it and yeah, use it too. for various things. But I'm such a fan of just having the basics, having a couple of good pans, having a good knife, having a cutting board. Um, just some of those really key basics are so like wooden spoons, a pair of tongs, like just honestly those um, basic things that you can, you can make everything with just those few things. Like sometimes I think we overcomplicate cooking. Like we need all these different tools and a garlic mm -hmm. press and a pineapple cutter and all these things. Pineapple cutter, yeah. <laughs> I've had the pineapple cutter, not a fan. <laughs> wait, 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 did you ever have, like a, year, a few years back, you had the pit remover from the avocado. You like yes. push this thing down. <laughs> and you waste a lot of avocado. So oh like, my gosh. Yes, so it's just, it's funny. So I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you love being in the kitchen and you love trying the air fryer stuff and all that, I think that's yeah. awesome. But I don't, for people who are sort of beginners, I don't think that, I, I think it's most important to focus on just having the basic stuff, like an, a sharp knife. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> makes key. all the difference. So everyone, a sharp knife. So when you buy a knife... You need a knife sharpener <laughs> you yeah. or someone who will sharpen your knives, but please mm -hmm. learn how to sharpen your knife. It's all over the internet, right? Just, yes. you, if you don't have a sharp knife, you can't cook. I know. It, or it makes it so much more difficult and then it just adds to the frustration. So I totally agree. Having a sharp knife is, and you don't need to buy a super expensive knife either. Yeah. There are so many out there that are 30 or $40 that will last forever. Um, yeah. So it's just really keeping them sharp. And like I said, the basics, same with cooking, just knowing a few basic things can make a huge difference. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it's, and I know in your heart, because you also trained as a dietitian, it's what, what we're learning right now is how kind of split open our public health uh, systems are, how underfunded they are. And to me at the heart of it's not at the heart of public health, but it really is, is knowing how to cook. Because yeah. knowing how to cook, even if it's simple, is homeland, it's homeland security, it's survival of your own health. Mm -hmm. But it also, the reason I'm mentioning that is, I was lucky enough to go to school when I had an amazing um, home ec curriculum. Mm -hmm. But I still have my books. I mean, basically, I went through culinary school. I really did. Like, I do all the mother wow. sauces, all the pastries, all the beets, everything. Yeah, it's such and, amazing. Yeah, it was amazing, but it's like, can we fund that, please, in schools? Please? I could not agree more, and I think, you know, I lived in, the, I live in the teaching kitchen world. I consult for teaching kitchen programs, and I, that's what my last job was, um, and so I love the concept of the teaching kitchen for adults and for kids, um, and especially in healthcare and community nutrition. There, that's such a growing thing, It is. but we should still be doing that in school and even when I was in school that was going away we learned a couple basic things like, like how to make cookies and oh, wow that's that's not survival that's entertainment that's right and so I think you know knife skills and some of those basic things that we don't always learn there are some schools who still do it but it's not across the board um and I it's so it's such an important skill to learn that we're just really missing these days. Well, I, I hope that there's one good thing that could come out of this horrible time that we're in right now. It's that um, children uh, and even uh, our, our, not our colleagues, but uh, you know, people we know can take the time to um, spend a little bit of time in the kitchen. I know you may not love it, but now you realize that you save a lot of time and money 
<laughs> and shore up your health by being in your kitchen, even if it's simple. So um, let's go back to that conversation when we talk about, okay, the pantry staples. Mm -hmm. We should do like a quick fire here, like five things you can make without knowing how yes. to. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I love this game. <laughs> So I, so I like to keep, I would say beans are a number one thing to have in your pantry. Oh, um, lentils kind of fall in that same category. They have a similar texture, but if you're not, if you haven't had them, don't feel like you have to go out and buy lentils. Like, oh my gosh, I'm kind of scared to try those. Beans are high fiber, high protein, tons of nutrition, so inexpensive. You can make chili or a soup easily. Stock, beans, an onion, a few spices, depending on what flavors you want to go for. Like if you want to go for a chili, something like chili powder, cumin, okay, cumin. Um, something like that. Super easy to make a bean, several different types of beans in one soup. Super Absolutely. easy. Um, that would be one of my number one things because of the nutrition aspect and how easy and convenient and cheap it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I would say for breakfast, if you haven't tried out overnight oats, I think they're awesome. Um, or just an oatmeal, but having just rolled, rolled oats, old fashioned oats, um, mixing them with a little milk, whatever your favorite type is. Mm. Um, maybe a little honey, if you like it to be slightly sweet, some cinnamon, put it in the fridge. Tomorrow you have breakfast. And then you can add whatever you want in there, like fruit, <laughs> frozen, fresh, whatever. Yes. And I've been living off frozen fruit because <laughs> I'm an Instacart delivery person since I have so, um, like I love, I love using their service since I, I go through so many groceries with my work that I do. Yeah. Um, but even they're backed up right now. So it's like, okay, I'm going through all my frozen fruits and adding them to the top of my overnight oats and that's breakfast. Some nuts, whatever you have on hand and that's breakfast. Um, so I would say those are two, probably two because I can you know, have breakfast and then lunch and then I can reheat my soup for dinner. Exactly. Yeah. Which is really easy. Um, let's see what else. I'm a pasta fan. I don't know if you're a pasta fan, but. <laughs> I saw your pasta. Wait, I saw, I'm like, she's doing pasta and I'm doing pasta. So whatever. Yeah. What, what did you make with pasta last night? And then oh, I'll see what I, mean, I did. It was awesome. The last awesome. few days I've had pasta. <laughs> um, the, the two nights ago I made one that had, it was just spaghetti with frozen peas, garlic, a little olive oil. And then at the end of the process, I added a couple of egg yolks because that's like carbonara-ish. And it, adds yeah, it was, yeah. Silky sauce, um, some salt and pepper, a little Parmesan cheese, done. Dinner was ready. <laughs> so that that's a go-to because it, it takes mostly pantry stuff and then some frozen peas, which I usually have. Yeah. Um, and then last night I had a frozen bag of cauliflower I saw that. So I steamed it, pureed it with a little milk, a little vegetable stock, some lemon juice, um, and then I added it to some olive oil and garlic in a pan and made sort of an Alfredo. It was awesome. It was so good. And so it was so easy. You used the cauliflower to add creaminess to the sauce. Like, so you didn't have to make a roux sauce. Exactly. And my husband and I both really love cauliflower, but you... Yes. You could not taste the cauliflower. It tasted like garlic and lemon and olive oil, which is amazing. I mean, you Brilliant. can't go wrong with that combination. But I didn't have to run to the store because I had everything in my pantry and a bag of frozen cauliflower. So that's a brilliant idea. I usually have frozen cauliflower, particularly now, you know, it's like, hey, get your, get your staples in because we don't want to keep running to the store. That's one of our, it's an obligation to our nation, right? To stay yeah. home uh, if you can. So of course I did the old fashioned thing. Last night. I laughed and like, oh, Julie Kay just did it. So I sitting there, I'm like, well, I'm going to make it more complicated, but I'm going to use up stuff in my refrigerator. So yeah, I had a little bit of fettuccine, um, but I did make a roux. So, you know, don't do this if you don't need to, but it's a classic <laughs> French sauce, you know. I love, I love a roux though too. So I do that and I, oh. I consider that a basic skill to be able to let some butter or oil melt, whisk in some flour, then add your liquid slowly oh, so that you can get that nice creamy um, sauce. Crispy. Yes. And that's so I, I was using a little bit of goat cheese and whatever else. Ooh, I, said that. 
end of end of some other teas. Um, but where I was going with it, that's why I laughed and like simultaneously we were doing something with, with pasta, um, is I just used up some odds and ends of vegetables and I just roasted them. So I happened to have a little bit of radicchio and chicory because we love that in our salads, but yeah. there was onion and whatever, uh, oh, some radishes and they just, I quickly um, roasted them. I could have put them in raw, but I'm like, no, nah, I want that roasted flavor. Like yeah. 12 minutes, right? And we, I just used a little Breville oven last night, not the big Whoa. oven. Yeah, I, yeah. So I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But you toss sure. it all together, and then if there's a salad or arugula or whatever, done. I know. It's so easy. And I do the same thing with, you kind of spurred a couple of other simple ideas. One, this time of year, I like to have squash. I mean, it la like a fresh butternut squash will sit oh, on yeah. your counter for a month and be oh, fine. Right. Or a spaghetti squash. Um, it's super easy way to make a meal like the butternut squash you can roast it or you can throw it in a pot with some water and soften it up and then make a pureed soup out of it yeah. something like that is super easy um, if you're into the frozen vegetable thing I always have broccoli too and I'll do um, like a broccoli cheese soup because of course we love our cheese in Wisconsin <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are just really easy things that you can make from from frozen or very shelf stable produce yeah Totally. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I forgot about it because squash is very sustainable. You know, it, it, yeah. it can last a long time. Um, right. It came out of the field, what, kind of into November, maybe where we are, depends on when we get the frost. Um, but the Breville, so <laughs> let's just talk yeah. about that real quick. So it's at, I grew up in Europe, had no idea what a toaster oven was. It's just like, we, we're, you know, and so give you an idea, in England when I, I grew up, um, you actually have, you know, we, we have our stove top, but above the stove or the cooktop, there would be like a grill, like a, what you call it, like a salamander grill, right? Yes. We yeah. actually have them. Uh, and so it's cool. You can kind of grill things like cheese on toast or your pork chops or whatever you wanted to grill. Sort of like um, a broiler, right? Like a broil. Like a broiler, but it's above, you know, instead mm -hmm. of putting it in the oven, you kind of put it, it's above. Now, is that, is whether that's still there, I'm not sure. I think so. Yeah, um, right. It's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so I'm like, toaster oven toaster oven what's one of those what do you do in a toaster oven so i ignored it until i got here to wisconsin and and, and my, uh, my guy said he'd always had a toaster oven and um so he's like we're gonna get a breath i'm like okay okay then he said don't you understand amanda it's not about toasting it's like a very small oven where you know you have this much space mm -hmm. but you can grill and toast and broil and you don't heat up a huge oven so last and the reason i come to that is you know here i was i was actually was cooking for myself last night i didn't need to do a whole big sheet pan of roasted vegetables it was just however many i needed and a few more for today mm -hmm. in there and in 12 minutes you know the thing heats up in five minutes basically and bingo you can toast broil is a really cool idea it is and I, you can make so many easy meals with that I mean I'm thinking of just really basic things like a tuna melt on toast with exactly I mean just anything that would honestly take five minutes to throw together and I love that idea because we can do that with so many things in the kitchen instead of feeling like it's going to take an hour to get something on the table uh, totally. And, you know, just kind of going back to the pasta idea, but you could do the same thing with beans, right? When mm. you roast anything, <laughs> it, it, it's so simple. Like, even if you can't cut something up, just chop things up till they're about the same size, right? A yeah. little bit of olive oil. Yeah, you could use dried herbs if you, you know, want some flavor there. Bingo. Like 12 minutes, just pull it out and they're, they're done. And you, you are a rock star because all the flavor is done in the, in the oven. I know. You pasta, you pasta your beans. And that's honestly one of my favorite cooking methods is roasting because oh. you can create so much flavor just from the cooking process that it doesn't take a bunch of extra ingredients to create flavor, which is huge. It is. Especially you, during these times. Yeah. <laughs> Rock star stuff. Easy. I love the idea of like the tuna melt, just simple stuff. Even if you, yeah. 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 Sometimes it's just a case of getting something in kids who seem to be enormously hungry. <laughs> right. That was the other thing I noticed, like, because I think as parents, I, and I'm not a parent either, but just with my colleagues, our colleagues, just like, where did their hunger come from? Because yeah. they're out of the house, right? Breakfast, they're gone, mostly come back, snack, dinner, but they're like us. Like, okay, now we're wandering around in four walls. What can we control? Oh, what we're eating. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. And it's fun. I've seen actually a lot of my friends who are at home right now with their kids 
are starting to cook. And it's just really fun to watch. Like, oh my gosh, look what the boys made me tonight. We had spaghetti and garlic bread and all these things that they never usually ate. And the kids were part of the cooking process. And Own in it. Woohoo! <laughs> love them. It's so fun because then when they're adults, it's like I learn these basic things that I can apply every single day. Yeah. Uh, and it makes cooking more fun when you've had some practice. It yeah, really no kidding. Sowing the seeds. So anyway, yeah. talking of cooking, you have a new book out. Yes. About it. It's uh, it's so on point. It's like it's fantastic. Tell us about your new book because I'm yeah, like, so well this is so this is sort of the second um of this topic that I've written on for a cookbook, and it's related to the mind diet, which is all around brain health and reducing the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, which is so very important. Um really, really just a sad, sad condition. And um, the, the really interesting thing is that for so many years, we did not realize how impactful nutrition was on these, on preventing these conditions. And um, the books are all surrounding the mind diet, which is a conjunction of Mediterranean and DASH diet, which is a heart healthy, both heart healthy eating plans. Um, that I like to call all inclusive because they're very, like when we think of diet, we think of like, I can only eat this many things or I can't eat all these things. And that's mm -hmm. not how I think of diet, um, which is why I really love this because it's really like all inclusive. We can really just make small changes in our diet that can actually have a huge impact on our brain health, which is very linked to heart health. Um, so the book is all about this mind diet and the foods and nutrients that really impact our brain function and our cognition and how we can incorporate them through simple cooking techniques, easy, fun recipes. Um, it's really, really cool. And the What's second it book, called? What's it called? Um, the, the, the new one that just came out is called The Brain Health Cookbook. The Brain Health Cookbook, that's right. Yes. And then the one that came out a year ago is called the Mind Diet Plan and Cookbook. So they're very similar in content from the Mind Diet's perspective, but they each have 75 completely different recipes. I love that. And you know, I had not realized it was modeled around the Mind Diet, um, and so which I love. And I was lucky enough last year to be in Australia at speaking uh, at the same conference as Dr. Dale Bradenson. Yes. Yeah, yeah, who's of course like such a pioneer in mm -hmm. the brain health Alzheimer's world um yeah so so that's super exciting and i think you'll pr probably agree i mean we really with that particular i think it's called disease i mean this health state i will we we do know we have the tools now to be able to steer it um to a much better course or even potentially to prevent it altogether mm -hmm. would you agree yes. yeah it really is fascinating and I mean, the science is still evolving around it, but the the whole concept of the mind diet came from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Um, Martha Claire Morris is one of the main researchers and, and physicians um, who actually really sadly just recently passed away, but she oh. is a, definitely a pioneer in this whole, in this whole arena. And um, so 2015 was the year that really all this came out for the mind diet. Yeah but it's continuing to evolve and but we still know those same principles of getting in omega-3 fatty acids and um eating enough vitamin e and b vitamins and beta carotene which comes from vitamin a um so we just know that these nutrients that are found in so many different vegetables and dark leafy greens and folate and folate Yes, folate. Folate, people. <laughs> and just some of these things that like egg yolks have choline, which is really exactly. important. Like just all these different things that, that are everyday foods, but just how, like how often do we need to eat them and how can we incorporate, how can That's we learn right. to cook with them and all those things. Um, but the, the cool thing is the recommendations are actually pretty easy to achieve. Like sometimes Absolutely. we hear like, we hear nutrition recommendations and it's like, there's absolutely no way I'm going to be able to eat fish every single day for the rest of my life. Totally, right. But you don't have to, like, we know from this research that if we just try to eat fish once a week, um, that has omega threes in it, then we are doing our health a huge favor. So I just love how, I love how simple the recommendations are, but how much of an impact it can make. 
in a so positive, true. Um, and I love uh, listening to you because you said oh, two words like leafy greens. I'm like folate, <laughs> egg yolks, choline. So yeah. you know, working in genetics, it, it, it's been so interesting because I'm looking at how people's genes perform, looking at many, many, many <laughs> different reports. And I will say, and I think you'll agree, probably the thing that comes to the fore the most is how deficient we are potentially in folate. I mean, folate. <laughs> It, and folate and choline kind of go together in biochemistry, right? So if right. folate's deficient, you can kind of pick it up with choline a little bit. There's a workaround, but um, I'm so glad to hear you <laughs> say leafy greens and egg yolks. It's nothing that we don't know in nutrition. It's just you're looking at it through a different lens, which is brain health. Exactly. So, um, and so all these things are good. Like a lot of people will say, well, you know, especially younger people are like, well, who's this cookbook for? It's for everybody, yeah. literally everyone. Like it's not too late for old, the older generation to start incorporating some of these things. It can still make a huge impact. But then Absolutely. as the younger generation, as you're growing up, these are huge things that you can do um, in your diet and the way you eat to make exactly. such an impact for your entire life. I mean, even kids. Yeah. So this is literally for everybody. And the cool thing is it's not just, this is only for brain health. It's literally for you all of your entire yes it's, exactly so that's what's really cool. like the heart of it too with brain health i think you know you really kind of it sounds like an amazing book because you're understanding the target ingredients and why but the other part of it of course is the blood managing blood sugars right and and that exactly. is just essential to brain health or all health it really but, is it really is and that's such a, an emerging thing too is is um blood sugar and insulin and how it impacts your brain health. And yeah. it's really just an, emer it's, it's emerging, but we know, we know what we can do in order to reduce our risk and manage that. And that's, what's really cool about the, these books is that they're so well balanced, but incorporate these foods in. So they're really just, they're really good for everybody. Yeah, totally. You know, you, you don't have to come with a disease to eat yeah. well. So yeah, exactly. but your brain, uh, you know, definitely is an outer, over time, like your heart, an outer manifestation of imbalances. So mm -hmm. yeah, so this is uh, like an awesome cook, but I did actually look through it and I, oh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. 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 I said, you, will you write the next cookbook with me, please? <laughs> I would love to. Let's, let's sign up for that. <laughs> yeah. So but, you know, the other thing that's important to me from the culinary side of things is just making it easy to incorporate these things into things you already eat. And I think leafy greens are kind of scary. Like They are. Let's talk about leafy greens. Yeah. Th why, they're so scary. I, I completely understand. I did not grow up eating all these different, you know, mustard greens and Swiss chard and kale and all these things. <laughs> kale was like a garnish you got on your plate totally. growing up. It wasn't part of the, it wasn't like I brought it home for my hamster. Um, <laughs> so I, like, I totally understand that it's kind of scary to like, grab this big, like, you know, plant. What am I supposed to do with this? But you can literally put them in everything you eat. You can exactly. chop them up. Like I, my husband is a little bit picky about certain things, but he eats spinach and kale pretty much every day because I, I chop it up really finely and I saute it in with our soups. Right. I put it in some, like, I keep talking about tacos because that's like the perfect example. Oh, Everybody loves tacos. tacos. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just chop it up and saute it in with my taco meat. And you barely even know it's there. But it, they're so nutritious, and most of us do not eat enough of them, that they're actually pretty awesome. And you can put them in pretty much whatever you eat. Well, and I think, too, these days, um, so many of these greens are now in mixes, right? They're in pre-mixes, we bagged, or you know, a bag, you can get a big bag of kale. But if you, that's scary to you, you can also get them in a spring mix, a braising mix, a whatever yeah. mix, right? So it's do you have to cut them? <laughs> no. And I think uh, people's, like, your mind automatically goes to a salad. And I love salads. So if you're a salad person, throw in some of those dark leafy greens, mix them into some other um, lettuces that you like, that you know you like, just to kind of mix it up. Um, so salads are a great way to do it, but it's just not the only way. I mean, right. if you if you are making the beet soup or the pasta or those things we talked about, just throwing a handful of those into each thing um can make such a big difference and help you meet the recommendations for 
for these vegetables and really make that that impact on brain health and heart health and all those things that are so important. Totally. And you know, what comes to mind too, like I, I always have arugula, you know, it's just a yeah. grab. I mean, you'll know by the whole heads and whole whatever, you know, whole bunches because they don't scare me, but some people mm -hmm. they do. But I'll always have a grab and go arugula. And one of the easiest ways to get those greens in is actually in an omelet in the morning, right? It's yeah. that ready, yeah. fold it over. You've got like a big old, a mouthful of greens. <laughs> no, it's true. And uh, actually, eggs are a great example because I make a lot of like egg bakes, like frittatas and yeah. an egg bake or the little muffin cups because they're easy to grab and yeah. mm -hmm. to work or wherever you're going. And though that's a perfect place to chop up a bunch of spinach or kale and and cook it in with everything else, and then you barely even know it's there. So if you're so if you're sort of intimidated by the greens, that's a great way to get them in. Just throw them in. Yes. <laughs> you know? Just throw them in. <laughs> but like you used to do a parmesan, like, you know, when you finish your dish with whatever, it's your new condiment. Just stir them in. <laughs> <laughs> the best supplement you can take. So. I know. Oh my gosh, it is. So that's what I try to do throughout the book is show how to incorporate those things in things that you already eat so that it doesn't seem like you're like doing a complete overhaul on your diet. It's just, how do we make these small changes I totally agree. that add up? We think alike. Absolutely. Yes. Just add it in 20 ways to, ways to add greens into your life. It's actually very simple. Mm -hmm. Starting with a smoothie, omelet, whatever. I love it. Smoothie. That's another great one. Yeah. Okay. It turns green. So what? It's the yeah. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh amazing amazing okay tell us again the name of your book because it's the brain health cookbook and i actually have it right here oh, yes. show, yeah. show, show, yeah. look and it's not you know like on facebook it turns like inside out or whatever you yeah. end up like oh the, my gosh like, the ambulance. it's too it's funny the brain yeah, health. there's just so many fun things in here like like breakfast enchiladas and um firecracker glazed salmon nuggets that like the kids would absolutely oh. love they're like little chicken nuggets but they're they're salmon and they're fun and easy to eat. There's, oh gosh. there's lots of cool stuff. And then even think, uh, wait, 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 I've got to go back to the, 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 the salmon. Is that made for canned salmon or, or filet? Well, how did you make those? That's awesome. So that, that one, I do have recipes in here that are made for, from canned or pouched salmon just to make life easy. Like some days that's going to be totally even, especially right now. Um, but this is actually made from fresh or frozen salmon that you would just Perfect. Um, thaw out. And then you cut them into little nuggets and make yeah. a little sauce that is a little spicy, but um, can adapt really, that. Yeah, exactly. So it's just fun things that you can that you can do that are a little bit different than maybe your normal because you want to spice things up. But there's also some recipes in here that are very, very sort of more typical. So it's a I good. Love it. So it's, it sounds like a book where whether you can cook or whether you don't. Mm -hmm um there's so many ideas in there and it's like you're just moving people's ideas just slightly to the right don't change too much add this in here's the benefit you get from it bingo 100 <laughs> percent on amazon right where is it <laughs> you have to get it online right now <laughs> um yes yeah, so you can get it on amazon you can also get it at barnes and noble yeah um, any any bookstore online um there's a ton of a ton of places you can get it so i love it book, so it's pretty it's pretty exciting yeah, yeah oh my god and do, do you have a blog too where people can follow you i do i do i i blog actually a couple times a week new recipes some recipes from the book to share um it's called the gourmet rd so that's, that's kind of my business name but it's the gourmet rd.com the gourmet rd it says the, the in there the gourmet rd.com yeah. yep and that's I my social seeing handle. this in my feed like, like who, where, where is she that <laughs> you're in wisconsin <laughs> Just I know. <laughs> I know. Oh so listen, what are you working on now? What, what, what are your projects right now? That's a great question. So um, I mentioned teaching kitchens earlier. So I do, I'm a consultant. So I have my, my blog and I share lots of recipes and do my cookbooks and social media and all that stuff. Um, cooking videos, all those fun sort of media things. But then um, teaching kitchen wise, I'm a consultant for a healthcare company, a health insurance company. Um, and okay. developing their teaching kitchen program and um, getting people in the kitchen and learning how to cook and all that fun stuff. So I do a lot of that type of work as well. So it's, it's really a dream, a dream career. It's all food and cooking related, which is, uh, 
And there's probably another book in there somewhere, right? If there, I might <laughs> <laughs> there might be. There might be. Well, it, you know, those of you who will be listening in the, on this is once we post it, I mean, you obviously, this, this is a gal who has a lot of ideas for you, wherever you are in the cooking spectrum. So take a look at a book and definitely go to the blog because I know it comes up in my feed and it's always full of like really like on point, great, actionable ideas. Nothing too complicated. Always filled with nutrition, but it's food forward, right? If you eat this way, you'll get the, you'll get the benefits. Here's how. Correct. And I just, I think that that's important to note. And I love that you picked up on that with what I, with what I share on, on the internet, because sometimes it's hard to communicate that. But I, I think that just like with cooking, we were talking about overcomplicating it. Sometimes we do that with nutrition too. And I don't, and that's what I'm trying to just make it really easy and, and not, so we have to stress over, should I eat this? Should I eat that? just let's, let's go back to the basics from cooking and nutrition standpoint and have fun with it. It's been great talking to my fellow Wisconsinite. <laughs> One day we'll be in the same city at the same time. <laughs> too far away, but great talking to you. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks.